So this was my family in the early 90s. And uh, we came to the United States as refugees, actually, leaving Russia in, in 1989. You may recognize me. I'm in the front row. And, uh, and my parents are next to me, and in the back are my grandparents. And so coming to the US as refugees, we were expecting everything here to be better. And for the most part, that was true. But there was one notable exception, and that was math education. And math education was very important to my family. My dad was a mathematician. My mom was an engineer. My dad's mom had been a math teacher her whole life. And my mom's dad had been a college physics teacher. So this is an important value for them. And, and, and they, were, they were concerned. And I'd say the most concerning moment was when my grandmother, the math teacher, after I finished and passed an Algebra I course, gave me two fractions to add. And I added the numerators and I added the denominators. And as it, as it turns out, this is not how you're supposed to add fractions. And my grandmother was absolutely shocked and scandalized. Because in her 30 years of teaching, not even her worst F students would have done this after an Algebra I course. <laughs> and so she went to my parents and she said, what is happening with my grandson? Uh, you know. So, so uh, basically, and then she sat down and she tutored me and she uncovered what the problem was. The way I had been taught was completely discombobulated. So, so I was taught superficially how to follow procedures and then you pass the test, you forget about it, you move on to the next class. No understanding, instead of algebra being built on arithmetic and arithmetic being based on understanding of numbers, it was all just superficial knowledge which I immediately forgot. So, so she tutored me, she filled in those gaps and I still remember those sessions. And there was another wonderful thing that happened, which is that during high school, I had, I had the great fortune to go to math camp, which was absolutely amazing. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and in math camp, I fell in love with math. They got me so excited. After those five weeks, I said, OK, I'm going to be a mathematician. And because my grandmother had filled in those gaps, it was actually possible. So I, I, I had the background. And, and I, ended up turning, I, I ended up becoming a mathematician eventually. Uh, but that really got my parents thinking. So, so I had two huge strokes of luck. I had, I had this grandmother who was an amazing math teacher, and I had the opportunity to go to math camp. And how many kids have either of those two things, much less both of those? So, so that sort of got my, my dad in particular thinking about the problem. And if you think about it, well, math education should be easy, right? Just, just talk to the teachers and get them to teach math better. Uh, and, and this is very common. Well, it's the teacher's fault. And in fact, that's not true at all. And, and the problem is much more complicated than that. And you find this out if you compare US math education with countries that are very strong in math education. What you find is that, is that teachers in those countries have a whole host of supports uh, that the teachers in the US are missing. So for example, outstanding textbooks in mathematics. Without that, there's not much that you can do. Lesson plans from previous generations of teachers that have been perfected that those teachers can use in their classrooms. Pre-service, so before teachers even start to work as teachers in their teacher colleges, excellent pre-service courses that give teachers really deep knowledge of mathematics. In service, so while they're already working as teachers, professional learning opportunities. So, so it's really a very complex system. It's an ecosystem of supports for instruction that makes good instruction possible. And if you don't have these things, then, then unfortunately, there's just nothing that can be done. And so, so my dad had been doing research in a type of artificial intelligence called expert systems. And he had an idea to apply some ideas from expert systems to try to get around this problem, to try to get around all of these huge challenges that make it hard to actually improve math education on a large scale. And so the idea of an expert system is say you have, you have some sort of human experts whose expertise is very scarce. So for example, expert medical diagnosticians are a good example. And so, so typically, you'd want every patient to have access to these, to these wonderful diagnosticians, but they're so scarce, very few patients actually do. So what you do is you sit down with them, and you interview them, and you extract their thought process. So how do they reason? How do they make decisions? What's all the knowledge that they use? In the case of medical diagnostics, when do they know to run a certain test? How do they interpret the results of tests and draw conclusions? And then you, you, you build all that knowledge into a computer system, which runs the same thought process that you, that you just got from these experts. And so it's a way of taking this expertise that's very scarce, that very few people have access to, and automating it so that you can make it available to many more people. And so my dad's idea was, can you try to apply this to education? Is there some way that this can make really high quality math instruction available to more students? And so he came to me and my mom, and at this time I was in high school, and he said, I have this idea, why don't we try it out? And fools that we were, we said, you know, this, this sounds great, let's do this family project. And so Reasoning Mind was born. And Reasoning Mind is a nonprofit organization uh, based here in Houston. And this is what we do. We develop software, and then we partner with schools to implement this in classrooms. Uh, and then we also work with teachers and with the schools. And so as we were doing this, uh, there's one thing that is very special about education. So education is extremely human. 
you cannot fully automate education or even really come all that close. And so there are some things that you can automate. For example, whole group instruction. The experience of being a student and sitting and watching a whole, a whole group lesson with the teacher and being asked certain questions, you can automate that pretty well on a computer. Homework grading, independent problem solving, or being asked closed-ended questions, like being asked two plus two, and then responding, and then the computer can actually make sense of that. But then there are things that you cannot automate. So for example, how do you automate the human bond between teacher and student? How do you automate encouragement? Or, and this is a particularly important one, authentic discussion and questioning. You can't automate a teacher asking a child to explain their reasoning, and then based on what the student says, listening to them, giving them feedback, engaging in that conversation. And that's essential for really excellent math education. Without that, you can't have great math education, and you can't automate it. Peer interactions and many other things. So the idea was, okay, what we need to do is we need to say there's this host of things that you can automate and a host of things that are essentially human, that are, that are not sufficiently routine to be automated. So let's automate the things you can automate. Let's, let's build computer programs that can do the things that are routine enough to be automated, but then let's train and support teachers in classrooms so that for the essentially human aspects of education, that's still there, that's not being neglected, and it's being done at a high level. So why even automate in the first place? There are two huge benefits of automating those things that you can automate. So one benefit is that that actually frees teachers to focus on the essentially human things. It's very rare as a teacher to have the opportunity to sit down with a child and actually have that authentic discussion because you just don't have time. But if you automate the things that are more routine, then it becomes possible. And a second benefit of automation is, it, is that it gives you greater consistency of quality. So a good analogy here is sewing and a sewing machine. A sewing machine not only makes it faster, it also allows your stitching to be more consistent. So by automating the things that can be automated, you can take advantage of these two things. And so what's the ultimate goal? The goal is to give each child the same educational experiences they would have if we could take them and magically transplant them into a classroom of one of the world's best math teachers. And if you think about it right now, that exists, but very few students have access to that. And so using this method by partially automating and then supporting teachers for the other stuff, it becomes possible to bring this to many more students. And so the concept is something that we've termed instruction modeling, and it consists of two steps. So first, you study the experiences of students in world-class math classrooms, and then you build a blended learning system. And blended means that it blends, it combines automated computer parts with, with a human part that replicates these experiences. And so that's the idea of this talk, is instruction modeling. So on a concrete level, what does this look like? So you start with an expert teacher, in this case actually many expert teachers, but, but let's focus on one. And for each lesson in a course, we ask them to write a script that describes how they teach it. We want to know everything. We want to know what do they write on the board? What do they say? What questions do children ask? If they play a game in the classroom, how does that look? And that ends up being 50 pages per lesson. And there's 120 lessons per a course, so that's 6,000 pages of documentation per course before you've even done anything else. And then after that, we have a team of knowledge engineers who are mostly math PhDs here in Houston who interview the expert teachers. And the goal is there are some things that maybe the teachers didn't put in there. So the goal is to really understand everything because we want to extract all of the reasoning, all the decision making that teacher makes in delivering that lesson. And so they conduct hundreds and thousands of hours of interviews. And then the knowledge engineer says, okay, now I know everything that this teacher does and all the experiences kids would have in their classrooms. What part of it can you automate? And then they design online lessons that automate those parts. So a typical interface is you might have a tutor character, two student characters, and then there's the actual student, and they all talk to each other. They write on the board, they ask the actual student questions, and the actual student answers, and then gets feedback. So it's actually a pretty immersive experience. And you can actually automate a good deal with this. And then for those really essential things we had seen before, which are essentially human and which can't be automated, that's where the support comes in. And there we have implementation advisors that go out to classrooms and actually talk to teachers, answer their questions, support them, and share best practices and put teachers in touch with each other so that they can learn from each other, so that they can constantly be improving their practice and doing those things. And so in reality, if you walk into a classroom, what it looks like, you see students sitting at computers, you see the teacher walking around, running the class, encouraging students, answering their questions, and perhaps most importantly, you see teachers pulling students aside, looking at data, and then using that to have those really authentic conversations where the children need to explain their mathematical reasoning and really have that discussion about mathematical thinking. So that's all fine and good in practice, but, uh, but does it work? And so, sorry, in theory, but does it work in practice? And so, so we've actually collaborated with researchers uh, from several universities, University of Houston being one of them, 
A&M another, and Columbia University Teachers College being a third with which we've worked, to actually measure the impact to see what result is this having on students. And to me, perhaps the most startling result is looking at time on task. You can actually measure time on task. And we found that time on task increases with this approach from about two thirds to over 90%. And if you think about that, that's huge. That's like adding the summer of instruction. Another thing that we looked at is the Singapore math test. And this is, this is a math test we wanted to look at, a, at an international standard. And Singapore is one of the strongest math education systems in the world. And so we used, we used the Singapore math test. And on the pretest, before, before the intervention, uh, the, the, the reasoning mind students that were gonna get the program were doing two percentage points worse. And by the end, they were doing 10 percentage points better, which is, which is quite substantial for one year. And another example. So in really world-class math education, it's not just about getting the right answer. It's also about mathematical discussion, mathematical reasoning, and even about the terms you use. And again, you can measure usage of advanced mathematical vocabulary. So this is one thing that we measured and we found that the program doubled use of advanced math terms. And finally, the most important thing is to ask the people that are actually using it. So last but not least, there was a recent study that came out of A&M actually, uh, which found that 91% of teachers want to continue next year, and 94% of students like or really like the program. So, uh, so I'd, like to, I'd like to make some concluding remarks. So instruction modeling, this approach, is really a two-step process. So first, you study the experiences of students in world-class math classes, and then you build a blended learning system, and this is very key. It's, it's not technology, it's blended between online as well as the teacher that replicates these experiences. And the effect is something that currently exists but is available on, only to a few privileged students who can be in the classrooms of teachers like my grandmother was, which is only a tiny fraction of the world's students. You can take that, you can study it, and you can make it available much more broadly. And I think there's an important lesson here, uh, even outside of education. If you think about it, we think about technology as something that allows new things, right? Before the technology, there was something that was impossible. Technology appears, and suddenly there are all these new possibilities. But there's a more pedestrian way to use technology, which I think can be just as powerful. There are some things that exist right now, but they're only available for a few people. And sometimes technology can be used to take those things and make them available in a similar form, but to many, many more people. And I think, I think this approach, while it's more pedestrian, can actually be, be, have, have just as big an impact. And I'd like to conclude with a, with, with, with a take home tip, so something that you can, that you can try at home. Uh, so, so the way that education technology is going, more and more of us are taking courses that are some sort of online or education technology courses. Maybe you'll be taking these courses in the next five, 10 years, and maybe your kids will be. And so how do you know if it's good? How can you tell if it's a good course or not? I think a litmus test that I would recommend as a, as a very good one is to ask yourself, what are the educational experiences you're getting in this education technology? Are these experiences as rich, as varied, as really awesome offline education? And if the answer is no, then that means probably it's not as good. So that comparison, I think, is a very important one to make. Because with education, it doesn't matter if it's online, offline, here, on Mars. Good education is always good education. It has the same rich experiences. It has the same important human component. And so as we think about education technologies, I think that's very important to keep in mind. So thank you.